this training is coming out of it's a, a group that's sponsored through the, through Lutheran Disaster Response, the Midwest Consortium for Disaster Services. Um, the group was found uh, was formed in 2014 um, with the idea of trying to investigate and identify uh, program sustainability methodologies um, for disaster programming within the Lutheran structure. Um, you know, within the Midwest specifically. Um, and so we are, um, you know, is also formed as trying to assist communities uh, in meeting their disaster needs, um, especially vulnerable populations in low visibility disasters. Um, a lot of what we deal with within the Central States Senate, as we'll find out as we talk more tonight, but our our vulnerable populations within low visibility disasters. And so, um, you know, today this group's made up of uh, the, the Central State Senate, Lutheran Social Services of Minnesota, Lutheran Family Services of Nebraska, then Lutheran Social Services of North and South Dakota. Well, South Dakota, North Dakota just recently is no longer. So that's out of date as of um, a couple, couple months ago. But, um, you know, as we, as we look through this information, you know, we're wanting the participant, uh, we fulfill participant expectations, and desired outcomes for this training. Um, we're, we're trying to look at the general concepts of disaster response and recovery um, and make sure that everyone's on the same page and understanding that. Um, and then we are um, just trying to get a basic disaster uh, principles and concepts and make sure people comprehend them. Um, before we move forward, do we have any questions or comments? Can you guys see the, the slides okay? Okay. Yep. So when, we, when we're first starting to look at, um, you know, disaster, one of the, obviously the, the first things to do kind of set a baseline of what is a disaster. And so we're looking at a, a very simple definition here, but so it's a natural or human caused incident that disrupts normal life, causing physical or emotional trauma. So a disaster is pretty much anything that kind of takes that normal life and puts it off kilter. Um, whether that's, you know, major damage to your home or trees down or, um, or, you know, anything from, uh, we'll go to the next slide where we can see where we're talking about hurricanes, the derecho, that was a, that was a thing that I didn't even know existed until that happened in Iowa last year. Um, tornadoes, windstorms, flooding, tsunamis, earthquakes, you know, as you can see the whole list here, you know, when we're talking about <clears throat> what do we typically see within the Central State Synod, what we're seeing a lot of is obviously tornadoes, windstorms, flooding, which we're experiencing right now um, as we're having a lot of rain. Um, I was saying before uh, most of you got on to, that, you know, there's, there's active flooding happening in Western Missouri and Southwestern Missouri. And I'm assuming there's flooding happening in Kansas too. I just haven't heard the reports of it yet. Um, but so there's there's people being impacted by water rising as we're as we're talking through this training. Um, you know, other th other things that we deal with a lot within the Central State Senate are you know snow and ice storms. They can they can be a big uh, impact. Um, we have home or wildfires. Um, you know, the big one that we are planning for in Missouri a lot is the New Madrid Fault earthquake um, that could happen at any any moment. There's no no warning to when that could happen. Um, but what they, they say is that's overdue for happening. And so when that does, it's gonna be a really big impact um, throughout the Synod, uh, but especially on Southeastern Missouri, St. Louis on down, um, will have a pretty big, big impact from that. And so, um, you know, but then when we're talking through disasters or potential hazards, you know, there's, there's stuff with like power outages or 
the uh, the building that just collapsed down in Miami, like that's a big deal. There's still 150 people that are missing from that. Um, and they're gonna need people to help them pick up the pieces after that instance. Um, you know, as they as things get sorted out and people's lives are kind of in the balance. So that's that's a lot of what we're addressing when we're when we're talking about disaster work. Um, and then obviously the last year has been has been so focused on COVID nineteen and the pandemic that um, you know all of our worlds have been turned upside down. I and mean, it's a little a little different than what a tornado or a flooding event does um but what's unique about it is that in some way shape or form it's a it's a disaster that has impacted everybody um and so and you can see from that list there's there's a lot of different variations as to what can be considered a potential hazard that would be a disaster um and so because of that we can be pretty broad in what we are and what we're doing and where we're um where we're trying to serve and who we're trying to help and how we're trying to do that um and so we'll get we'll get to that a little bit more uh later in the meeting though um one of the big partners um within the disaster work that that we lean heavy into um is emergency management whether that's local emergency management um or statewide emergency management or the federal emergency management agency fema um, but a quick definition on what emergency management is it's the managerial function charged with creating the framework within which communities reduce vulnerability to hazards and cope with disasters and so we have our our governmental structures that are are set up to help us um help us when we have a disaster, when we have, um, you know, when, when we're planning, like I said, we've been planning for the New Madrid Fault uh, to go off for, for years and years and years. Um, but so that's our emergency management structure, you know, the state emergency management in Missouri is a big partner. Um, and then the Kansas Department of Emergency Management, KDEM, is a big partner of ours as well in Kansas. And so we work hand in hand. If we don't have relationships with emergency management, um, it's really hard to have solid information um, as to what to do. Right before this call, I was on a call with our voluntary agency liaison with the state of emergency, uh, state of Missouri emergency management um kind of talking through what we needed to do to communicate what was happening with this flooding and so <clears throat> i was one of a, a few a handful of people on a call trying to coordinate the communication that's coming out uh about the flooding and so um those those in, those relationships are vital um one of the places where um where it's super important is is relationships with local emergency management and that's one of the places where um you know individual involvement churches involvement is is vital is having a place with a you know with a bought in you know developed relationship with the local emergency management that helps um us tie in better to to what's happening on a local level when something happens you know i have a lot of relationships with local local emergency managers throughout especially in missouri because i've been working here longer but it's one of those things that there's too many of them for one person to develop the relationships with them um, and so that's a vital a vital part of having a network of churches a network of volunteers is having different places to, to have folks plug into and connect and get to know emergency managers. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that some. So when we, when we talk about disasters, uh, we kind of, we often talk about disasters in the four stages, four phases uh, or of what the disaster is. And so that kind of, it starts with, I mean, you can look at it with the preparation work. So you're doing preparedness stuff. You're getting people ready for the the chance 
of a disaster happening. Um, as you're preparing them for that, you're you're doing things like you know business operations, business continuity plans. You're doing family planning, um, individual planning. You're making um, making plans and communicating it with loved ones as to what you're going to do in the case of an emergency. Um, you know, then the next thing would be an event happens, you know, we're talking about how there's flooding happening, right? As we're, as we're talking. So this flooding happens, um, the waters rise, they break through the, um, break over the levees or they break through the sand piles and, um, sandbag piles and those kind of things. And homes begin to get impacted. Um, so that first thing that happens is a response phase. And so during that response phase, you have, um, it's kind of the, the most important thing is making sure that people are okay and that, that life can continue to move on. And so during that phase, you're dealing with, um, you're dealing with everything from, um, you know, mass feeding, uh, making sure that people are fed and making sure that people are sheltered, um, setting up shelters and setting up uh, feeding operations to doing things like muck out and um, debris removal. And um, that's when the local emergency management, police, fire, all of those folks are clearing roadways and making sure that buildings are safe and um, things that don't fully address all of the need that's left after the disaster, but gets things to a kind of a stable place to make sure that, um, that you can continue life, that you can step into the next phase, um, which is a recovery phase. Um, and so all of, as we talk through these stages, it's helpful to know that they, they're not, it's not fully, um, linear it, it kind of melts they kind of go back and forth and melt into each other with how these these different phases work um but at response sets up and hands off over into the recovery realm um where recovery is when we're dealing with the needs that are left over that weren't able to be addressed in that initial response phase when you're dealing with the emergency um this is where a lot of the reconstruction happens this is where um, you know, we're helping connect people to resources in the community to help them get new furniture, to help them get back into their home, to ensure that the community doesn't lose that household, um, you know, long term uh, as they, you know, that's, a, that's one of the big challenges, too, is making sure that communities keep their population, you know, and a lot of our different different areas of throughout the state. Uh, throughout the states of Missouri and Kansas, we have, you know, dwindling rural populations or elderly rural populations. And, um, you know, for instance, the, the flooding that just happened a month or so ago in the Natoma, um, Kansas, you know, that the population there is, is older and it's in a, in a rural area. And there's a major concern that, you know, they're going to lose people that won't come back um, after the flooding happened. Um, and part of why that's such a big concern is that you lose people from the community, you lose tax paying dollars, you lose people that can fill jobs or have businesses to host jobs. Um, you lose students that go to the school that, you know, is paid by head, you know, of who is there and who's present. Um, and so there's just all kinds of underlying things that are, really driving why and then just the, the basic decency of, of trying to help people out when they are you know in a really tough spot in a low spot and so that's when we want to come alongside and really help within the structure that's established to help get people back on their feet so that's kind of the snapshot of what recovery is um, and then the last phase of disaster is mitigation um, so when we're talking about mitigation, we're talking a lot of the, um, you know, disasters happened and they're, they're trying to, to fix the roadway or, you know, 
mitigate a building or something within the community to make it safer, stronger, better, more equipped to handle something of a similar um, event. And so um, historically, you know, Lutheran disaster response, we play within all the phases of disaster, um, but we play probably heaviest in, in the recovery realm is what we've been known for um, over the years. We've been known for um, doing a lot with disaster case management, um, doing a lot with long-term recovery um, and helping out uh, to, to work through the, the long-term recovery groups that are established after a disaster, um, supporting them and providing funding and volunteers to, to do projects and, and those kind of things. And so we do a lot of work within the recovery realm of disaster across the country. Um, we also do a lot of work within the preparedness realm um, where we, you know, do, do work on an individual level, um, do it with congregations in some places, do it with businesses and other, you know, other folks that are interested. Um, but, you know, another big place is doing, participating um, within some of the big statewide planning for things um, such as the new Madrid earthquake and um, other things like that with, with being a part of the process, being a part of understanding what's happening, what's going on so that we know, <laughs> and we're more uh, we're best equipped as a as a synod to um, to step in as Lutheran disaster response from a church wide perspective. So we are you know as LDR ready to to step in and be uh, be a part of the process. So we we do we work heavily within the recovery and pre uh, preparedness um, phases of the disaster. Um, response has been one that uh, certain areas of the country uh, had done more in um, within the LDR network. Um, and that's, that's a lot of the, like the chainsaw crews or the folks going in to clear out the debris right after a disaster. Um, you need to have a good volunteer base um, and folks that are, you know, ready to go on a moment's notice to really do a lot within that realm. Um, and that, uh, there's definitely place for um, for us to build capacity there. And so part of what we're exploring in this conversation and others is um, is what does does this involvement look like for the Central State Senate? Are there one of these um, or a couple of these phases that seem to be calling our names to, to really get us involved and get us excited and what's going to get the folks that you know at your congregations or other people you know throughout the senate excited to participate in this and so we have like i said we have a flexibility to um to really take a take a minute and um assess and look at that um, we'll get we'll get to some more of that here in in a, in a few minutes um and so as you're looking at these these phases of the disaster, you know the disasters happened, and you're just kind of looking at what what even is a way to understand um, the length of time that it's going to take for that community to reach its recovery. Um, and there's no real full way to understand that, but one way of that that the disaster world has you know looked at that you know, over the years has been through this principle of 10. And so each stage is estimated to be 10 times longer than the previous phase. And so um, if you have a rescue, they, you know, a rescue that lasts 10 days, um, then that relief, that, that early response, that's going to take 100 days. And then that would lead into uh, 1,000 days of recovery. Um, and so that gives you that, that rescue goes into that. Um, we didn't have that spelled out specifically in the, the response, but that's the first initial stage within the response phase. And so that's the, we're making sure that everybody's safe. We got the roadways open. We got the, you know, all of that. Um, and so you can tell by how much damage and how, you know, how long that takes. It's a, it gives you a pretty good idea as to, 
um, to the length that the recovery is going to take. And all of this, it, it really hinges upon what does it look like for the local community? Even if it's, even if it's a big flooding event that crosses state borders and, you know, goes into different counties and different communities, each community, each county, each city is going to, to recover and respond and do all of that on their own pace and their own time frame, And that's, that's okay. And it's helpful to remember that. Um, but this is just a, a way of understanding and looking at, you know, kind of getting an estimation as to what to expect. Um, so as we, as we look at kind of disaster and the structures and organizations that we team up with, you've heard me mention a few of these already. So kind of starting at a, at a top-down approach as we're looking at this. So we have our Federal Emergency Management Agency, which FEMA, you know, everyone knows the name. Um, FEMA can be a four-letter word to some people and kind of a, uh, um, a trigger for them. Um, and that's because, you know, we don't always look at FEMA in the appropriate way. You know, FEMA is an incredibly important partner in this disaster world. Um, they are a leader. They bring resources. They bring um, people, money, and all kinds of stuff. Um, they bring attention, too. Um, but they don't bring all the answers. They don't bring all of the, uh, you know, they're not the end-all be-all. They're not going to fix every community in every single situation. They're just a piece in the wheel. And that's a really important place for us to lean into and look and understand what, you know, what's FEMA's role. Um, we can dive more into that in another conversation. Um, but one of the things that FEMA has is they have these voluntary agency liaisons um, who their whole job is to work with folks like myself who represent the voluntary uh, you know disaster organizations um, and we so we work we have a a direct line to the federal government um, in kansas our 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 FEMA val is a guy named John Gilletta in Missouri it's a lady named Deanne bass um and then in Nebraska and Iowa it's a guy named Mike Pickerel. I know all them very well and they're they're great partners and great people um that are you know passionate about the work that they do and and really helpful um place for us to to be able to have a connection into um so those those voluntary agency liaisons really help connect us to uh, the information that we need. They help advocate for us when when we're trying to get a disaster declaration or anything like that. Um, and so they have they have a lot of different roles that they that they do to help with the process. You know, next we we have the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, the National VOAD. And so what the National VOAD is is it's a it's a big structure that um, kind of puts all of the different disaster groups under one umbrella, under an umbrella that we can all agree to points of consensus, um, kind of agree to an approach that we all feel is, is appropriate and, um, you know, that we're, that we're working together. You know, they have the four C's that they talk about, which is communication, cooperation, coordination, and collaboration. And those, those four C's are a way that we're working hand in hand with, you know, the Presbyterians or the Baptists or the Red Cross or the Church of Scientology or the Buddhists or the, um, you know, the different folks representing Islam or representing Judaism or um, it, it, it is a group of everyone. And the whole goal of that 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 organization, that organization of um, different organizations, is that we're working together with the main goal of of helping the local community. Um, and so, Lutheran Disaster Response is a is a 
is a member agency of the National VOAD, and through that, we have representation um, at National VOAD. I I sit on a couple things at, at the National VOAD level, including um, participating in the the National VOAD's committee for long-term recovery. Um, so, and I represent the state of Missouri for that. Um, so then we look down on the, the state emergency management agency level. So whether that's KDEM um, in Kansas, Kansas Department of Emergency Management or SEMA, the state emergency management agency in Missouri, um, that's, that's that next level down having those relationships um, you know, from a Senate perspective and, and being able to, to get a grasp on, on situational um, information uh, is, is really vital. Um, each, uh, within each state, they also have that um, state voluntary agency liaison, similar to the FEMA one, um, whose job it is to communicate with organizations such as uh, such as us or, you know, Catholic Charities or Southern Baptists or whoever else, um, make sure that that communication is happening, that we have a direct line to the state government. Um, and, and we do have direct lines to the state government in both Missouri and Kansas as a result of those rules. Um, so we have the, the state voluntary organizations active in disaster where Central State Senate is a member of both the Kansas VOAD and the Missouri VOAD, and I'm actually the vice chair of the Missouri VOAD. Um, and so in the leadership of what's happening on a statewide level um, when it comes to our response and our recovery work um, and coordinating and communicating that. Um, and then on the local level, we have community organizations active in disaster, which are called COADs. Um, and I'm, I'm actually the chair of the COAD here in St. Louis City and County. Um, and we have COADs spread throughout both of our states, um, you know, in, in different pockets. You know, I know in Kansas, there's the, the Kansas City Regional COAD, which goes across um, the state line um, for Kansas City, um, covering both Missouri and Kansas and, and the work that they do. And, you know, there's uh, there's a, a co-ad in Wichita there, or in uh, Topeka, and I think there might be one in Wichita. There's one in um, the Manhattan area. And so they're kind of spread throughout the state. Um, you know, in Missouri, we have them. We have a few more um, established co-ads um, throughout the state, but, you know, all of the major areas of Missouri um, are covered by a co-ad or a regional co-ad. Um, and then different pockets within different areas of the of the state have co-ads as well. Um, those community organizations active in disaster really is another another place that um, you know when we're looking at vital congregations and places for our our congregations and our churches to be making a really big impact within our communities, being tied into the local co-ad. Um, really is, is a helpful thing. Um, it, it, it gets you in relationship with, um, you know, with the different helping organizations within the, um, within the local area, but then it also lets people know the places where your church um, is able to, to provide assistance or to provide resources and enables you to get tied in right away with how to help. Um, and so I, that, that's another thing that I'd love to, to talk with folks about how to get, get them connected into what's going on with the local co-ad. Um, and if there isn't one that exists, how do we, how do we try to advocate for that and talk to local emergency management and some of the other organizations that are working in that area to see if we can have, if we can get a co-ad started. Um, so those are all really good. Um, but then the kind of the last thing on this list is long-term recovery groups and those long-term recovery groups um, are usually set up when a disaster happens and there's not a co-ed that exists and so that's a group of folks that exist within within that local community that are going to drive the process of recovery for that community and so that's made up of people from um, 
you know, churches, from schools, from, you know, nonprofit organizations, mental health folks, uh, public health folks, um, local government people, all kinds of people, um, pretty much whoever the key stakeholders within that community that are going to to advocate for the community and drive a process, that's who's involved in that. And so that long-term recovery group can either be set up um, outside of itself, um, outside of anything else as a, as a, a group for a specific instance, or it can be a long-term recovery committee that's based out of a, um, out of, out of a co-ad. And sometimes you have those long-term recovery groups when the disaster is over and the recovery has happened in, in that, um, you then can can move that into a co-ad and kind of have a, a long-term structure that's that's there to help. Um, there's other there's other structures within the state and within local um, you know local areas. Whether that's you know there's there's things like disaster housing task force task forces and um, feeding task forces and and those kind of things that are that are meeting on a regular basis to um, to plan and talk through what it looks like to help people um, in a disaster. So we have um, looking at the types of disasters. So you hear about disaster declarations. Um, you have a couple of, of of things. You either hear the common terminology is, you know, it's a declared disaster, it's an undeclared disaster. That can be a little confusing in some ways. Um, and so as we're looking at, usually what we have within our states is undeclared disasters. It's the most common type of disaster. Um, part of why we see a lot of that is because our population is spread out outside of, you know, our, our five or six main population centers across Kansas and Missouri. You know, we have uh, a lot of rural land, and so um, it doesn't matter if a tornado impacts six people or 600 people, you know, for each of those people that, you know, they're equally impacted. And so, um, you know, we want to be able to help them. But what the difference is within each of these declarations or non being undeclared is the level of help and aid that is, is available. So there's, there are state declarations that can happen where the state can open up uh, some, some internal money, um, that's money or other resources that, that could be available um, to, that go beyond what you know, is available through the local community's capacity. Um, and so whether that's, um, you know, that could be a lot of different things. And in each state, it looks different to what, what a state disaster could be, but that's, um, you know, that's something that's declared by the governor that, um, you know, could then get, get folks like the National Guard or someone else involved to, to help out um, in the different phases. Um, and so the, the last thing is the federally declared disasters, um, which those, those can get a little confusing um, as we're looking at, um, you know, kind of this, this structure of, of how things work and how they happen. So it kind of builds from each. So the local community starts looking at its capacity and how to deal with it. And the state can get involved with, with the state disaster declaration. Um, take a pause here for a second. One of the things that's unique about both Missouri and Kansas is that both Missouri and Kansas are um, their local um, I'm going blank on the, the terminology right now. Um, pretty much what, what the way that it works is it's um, the local community has the right to say whether or not the state gets involved. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the terminology. Um, but so if the, if the local community says we don't want the state involved, the state's not going to get involved. Um, and, you know, and it, in Kansas, they, they, their state government takes out a little more, um, you know, black and white than Missouri's does, and that's okay. It's just the way that um, the way that it happens. Um, but so that's that's one thing to like to consider here 
when we're talking about these declarations is you have to have communication with the local government, the state government, and the federal government in order to make these declarations happen. And so sometimes because the, the local entities um, aren't communicating or aren't communicating well, um, it, it impedes the ability to get the, the right level of, of help in there. Um, and so, um, so when we're talking about the federal disasters declarations, um, those can be on several different levels. Um, one of which would be um, it, uh, public assistance, a PA declaration, and that's the more common of the the federally declared disaster declarations. Um, and what that PA declaration is is it takes a look at um, all of the public um, impact. So roadways, buildings, um, infrastructure, those kind of things. And so that, if a PA declaration is declared, that means that there's significant damage to the infrastructure that's happening within the state, within the local community. And so there's more need for the federal government to provide resources, to provide programming, to pr provide funding mm -hmm. um, for that, that impacted area. And so that's gonna, um, you know, it's a little more common, especially for us, like I said, with our populations being spread out um, in order to get to the next level, which is the individual assistance. Um, that individual assistance declaration, uh, FEMA has formulas and, and financial caps and those kind of things that the damage has to, to hit before it can, can turn on the, the declaration. Um, and so um, th there's a little, a little gray as to what that, that fully looks like, but you know, if there's a, a, a community of 250 folks that are, you know, like uh, Natoma, like we talked about earlier, they, you know, had 250 homes, 150 of them significantly damaged and that's not enough to, to turn on a, a disaster declaration. Um, and so, uh, so we have these, these disaster declarations that we can get, you know, Missouri's had quite a few of them over the years. Um, I can't think Kansas has had a few less, um, but what those, what that individual assistance declaration does is that's when it opens up the resources from FEMA for um, individual households and individuals to gain access to those grants and to that funding. Um, it also opens up things like the SBA loans, small business administration loans that happen. Um, and that, that can be a, another fully separate declaration level of an SBA declaration where um, people can, can get loans from the federal government. Um, but they're not going to get the, the the grant money that doesn't have to be paid back. Um, and so with that, you know, I, people can get confused with, with SBA and why the Small Business Administration is who individuals go to for disaster loans from the federal government. And the reason why we use the SBA is that's the, my understanding is that's the only branch in the federal government that can lend money to an individual um, and so through that it's a process that's already well established and well used and um, it enables to get money into people's hands for you know very minimal um, you know minimal interest um, interest rates and those kind of things but to get get some liquid resources into people's hands to help with their recovery um, so each of these different levels of disasters, um, it can get confusing. Most of the time you're going to see, like I said, the undeclared disasters, um, and then the federally declared disasters. We don't, I don't feel like we see a lot of state declared disasters here in, in Missouri or Kansas that don't end up being federally declared disasters. Um, because in order for the federal federal declaration to process to start, um, the the local, you know, the governor has to request FEMA, and then FEMA puts a 
recommendation before the, the president and then the president makes that declaration. Um, so we talked a little bit about this and we have one more slide, I think after this, and then, um, then we'll kind of put a, put a pause on this conversation. So um, when the disaster happens, we, we function out of long-term recovery groups. And so what we feel, um, you know, is a best practice for getting the work done, for having the communication happen um, that needs to happen, for making sure that um, people are being served based on need and not based on who they are, um, and making sure that, you know, people aren't taking advantage of, of the resources that are available. Um, a big part of that is having organizations be in communication and working hand in hand together. Um, and so that's what this long-term recovery group provides throughout the process. Um, and so you can see there's a whole bunch, these are these circles on the outside here, or a whole bunch of different places where um, it can be different committees that a long-term recovery group can have. Um, but a long-term recovery group doesn't need to have each one of these committees. And I could talk to you all day about each of these these bubbles and what they mean and why they're important. But what the most important thing is to have an idea of what what is what's the capacity of the local community and what's what's going to be realistic. And so, seeing that you know having having something like volunteer management, disaster case management, and emotional spiritual care, having three different committees could be could be plenty to have. Uh, you know, have a successful, um, you know, go at, at the, at the recovery. You don't have to have all, you know, what is this eight, eight different, you know, subcommittees or anything like that. Um, and so the, the long-term recovery group, um, gets set up and gets going and they, they establish themselves. Um, ideally they establish themselves goals goals to work out of and mission statements and those kind of things that establish a, a clear cut. This is who we are, why we're doing this and when we know our work will be done. Um, and so if there's more interest in learning more about what that, that recovery process looks like, we could do another conversation, but that's just too big to try to squeeze into this hour and a half. Um, and I, Cause I want to, leave some more, leave, leave some room for us to talk afterwards. So here's the last thing that we have. Um, it's kind of this looking at this emotional impact of disasters, um, kind of showing it through a graph that is, to me, it's helpful because um, it kind of takes you through the roller coaster of what's happening in, emotionally, internally, um, happening on a community-wide or organization-wide basis when a when a disaster or a significant event happens so i'm i don't think any of you know this probably but i'm a licensed professional counselor that's what i i got a master's degree in counseling and um, before i got into disaster work i was doing counseling with with middle school kids and families and those kind of things and um, i'm still active with my disaster or with my uh my counseling license in the state of missouri and Still have a big passion for it, and so this uh, this emotional impact to me is really helpful to talk with people through. Um, you know, I told you how you know I, I've participated in a lot of different long term recovery groups across um, you know throughout lots of different places within the state of Missouri uh, as of COVID and not having enough disasters happen in Kansas yet. I haven't had a chance to participate in as much in Kansas. But part of this, you know, it's really helpful to, to, to give people an image to look at, um, to give people this image to show, you know, you're having, you have this pre-disaster kind of groundwork where you're at, you know, there's a warning, there's a threat, and then an impact happens. So the disaster happens and um, a lot's going on. And at that point, the bottom of the emotions haven't fallen out because you have your adrenaline, you have that community support, you have the, the different, you know, 
little catchy things like the Joplin Strong that they used when the big Joplin tornado happened. Um, what, those different catchphrases that are, you know, building this community impact, this community togetherness, this um, all of this kind of it's a heroic feeling as you're kind of climbing up to the top of this of this disaster roller coaster and you're in that honeymoon phase. All of a sudden, the, the, the cameras go away, the news media goes away. There's, there's not as many people coming in from the outside wanting to volunteer and um, it kind of feels like you've been forgotten and that the floor drops out real quick um, to where you can kind of drop down into the disillusionment phase um, where you're kind of going back and forth and up and down a little bit, um, you know, and different things <coughs> are causing you to go up and different things cause you to drop down. You know, at this point, too, one of the things I didn't say about long-term recovery is it's, a, it's called long-term for a reason because it takes a long time to get the things in place that need to happen to make sure that people can recover from a disaster. And so um, part of what goes into that disillusionment is the fact that it's a long process. It's a long process to do it right. And so making sure that um, we have a you know, have the process in place to have the the resources ready to go and have the volunteers and the the money and all of those kind of things to do rebuilds and to to help put people's lives back together. You know, it's a, it's a big thing. Um, but so it also takes a long time for disaster case management to be happening and to build, be building that process and to be building um, cases and be able to get to see some of these these things um to build up and so we have people get discouraged and they don't see the progress but then eventually they see you know the smith's house over on maple street they got they got back in their home and they had people help them and see this happening here and the grocery store reopened and so you're kind of slowly climbing back up um all the while different things can trigger you and whether that's you know, flood warnings, flash flood warnings, or tornado warnings, or whatever the disaster was, if there's something that's, you know, if, even if it's just gray clouds in the sky, like that, those kind of things can trigger people and impact them and how they, they deal with um, life after the disaster. And so, you know, a lot of times there's, there's a little bit of a, a fall down, you know, people being triggered from the anniversary of the disaster. But eventually, you start climbing back up to a place that you're you're in a stronger place as a community, a um, little bit higher than where you were um, before the disaster happened. And so when you're down in the bottom of that disillusionment there, it's really difficult to get a community to understand. I know it doesn't feel like this, but it's part of the process. And you don't believe me now, but we will climb out of this because we're going to climb out of it together. And so that's just kind of the, 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 the process. And so when you're, when you're looking at this, when you're looking at the emotional impact of a disaster, um, you know, each one of us that are part of this conversation right now um, would be impacted in a different way than the next. And so we would all be in a different place on that, that roller coaster um, at different times, and so it's not it's not a cookie cutter thing. It's not something that um, you know that's going to look the same for each of us. Or you know you can look at it organizationally like that too. Um, but what it does is it helps people understand just because you know I'm I'm at this place that doesn't mean that Myron's at this place with me and um, so we have, we all have different reactions and different responses, and it just helps give us grace um, to each other, helps us know how to love our neighbors better and how to interact with people um, through this process, how to hold someone's hand when they need to be, have their hand held and, and um, give someone a hug when they need that, or how to just go about and do what you need to do so you can survive. Um, and so it's, it's a helpful image to me, um, you know, 
that, and this is a, it's a concept that is used throughout the disaster world. I think it's been used for several decades. Um, but I think that's our last, that's our last slide. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. Do we have any, uh, any questions or, um, initial comments or feedback from all of that. I know I just talked for about 45 minutes straight and dumped a lot of information on you all. So do we have any questions? I was just curious if there had to be a number of people affected, like back when you were describing the low level um, tragedy or, or disaster, is there any kind of tie into it's gotta be over hundred or over 50 or anything that ties it to numbers affected? Yeah, I mean, the, the place where those numbers really come into play to be significant is whether or not FEMA is getting involved. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. And so those numbers for that look, look different. I mean, and, and then it also, the level of coordination and communication that's happening between um, on a, like a statewide level or a regional level, even um, that's happening would look l different for you know a small F1 tornado that impacted 20 homes with one home being completely mm -hmm. destroyed. You know something like that is going to have a different level of communication to it. Sure. Um, but it doesn't mean that like there's not a set a set level that you know would trigger us to get involved. You know one. One person could have one family in your church could have their their siding ripped off from straight line winds, and that's as big of a disaster to them as as it was if you no know, another two hundred homes were impacted. And so, yeah. if there's you know a whole long term recovery group is probably not going to set up for for you know right. a handful of homes, but because that that can really those those things can really be need to uh, be used to address. Um, address what's needed um, within that local community. And so a lot of times that stuff can be handled. So the more that the more that's impacted, the, the less likely that that local community can handle that on their own or the local mm -hmm. church, you know, if it's one or two homes, the local church may have the resources or the volunteers to help to get them back on their feet or, you know, mm -hmm. those kind of things. One of the, one of the things that 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 this information didn't touch was, you know, when we're talking about insurance. Um, so a lot of times, you know, when we're talking about flooding, about 90% of people don't have the insurance that they're supposed to have. Um, flood insurance is really expensive and it's hard to get. Um, and, and, you know, when we're talking, you know, low income, vulnerable populations, non-English speaking populations, different stuff like that, there's all kinds of barriers to getting people to get the the protection that they need um, to ensure that um, that they're covered when that disaster happens. Um, and so often it's about 90% of people are either uninsured or underinsured when it comes to flooding. You know, when it comes to when it comes to a tornado, when it's an quote act of God like that, that the insurance covers on your basic homeowners or renter insurance, um, it, that that number kind of flips. And so tornadoes, um, oftentimes they don't need as much money as a flooding event does because a lot of insurance money is, is involved, whether it's fully insured or, mo or mostly insured. Um, a lot of people have the appropriate insurance. When it comes to a flood, that insurance money, it doesn't exist most of the time. And it's most of the time we're dealing with the poorest, the most vulnerable, the, the neediest people that, that are in our communities because they're living by the, the river or the creek. Um, in the floodplain, living in a place that's been handed down generation to generation. Uh, and so there's, there's lots of challenges with that. Um, and then things like earthquake insurance, a lot of insurance uh, providers won't sell it to you on the, on this, in this portion of the state, uh, on the eastern portion of the state, um, 
because it's, I mean, it, it's, it's expensive to have. I, I have it, but, you know, I know I have friends that have tried to get it, that they can't get it because their insurance provider won't give it to them. Um, and so that's, you know, when we have a massive earthquake event and half the, you know, half the state of Missouri is heavily impacted, um, a lot of those folks won't have the insurance just like a major flooding event too. So um, that's where those resources are really, really needed. Um, and so also where we have to get really creative um, because, you know, when, when you have a tornado, those are kind of the, like the, the catchy, the, the attractive disaster, if you will, because it has, which is terrible to say, but it has all the destruction that the, the media wants that looks good on the cover of a newspaper or leading off the 10 o'clock news. Where flooding, it happens, and it can be just kind of a silent disaster where you see the water rise up and you see it go down and you assume because the water's down that everything's fine, but, um, you know, the, the mold and the, the impact to the structural integrity of buildings and those kind of things um, really have, uh, you know, a big impact on, on things. And so financially, especially because it just doesn't draw in the money that tornadoes do. So that's a long answer for your question of, um, you know, how do you, right. you know, is there a number that, that sets it off? And it's, it's really yeah. where, wherever the need is, you yeah. know, my goal is to always have some, some level of aid that we have available within our account within the Senate to help out with the, an instance that's happened right away, um, then we have the we have the ability to either make ask for an ask within the synod for money or write a grant to Lutheran Disaster Response or be creative in how to gain access to funds outside of that. But um, we should always have at least a very minimal amount to help us get going um, and helping folks as quickly as we can. Any other questions or? Not yet, uh, particularly. You know, as we talked earlier, I did do some research on grants. And uh, it, it really appears that that's a difficult one out there. Uh, if you're mm -hmm. not tied to either the FEMA or the state granting processes, uh, so far, I haven't found any other grants out there. There may be some church communities that might have some grant money or funds set aside. Uh, whether they're willing to share those for, unless, uh, you know, unless they actually determine that it's a disaster they want to uh, service. Um, I'm still looking, but thus far, grant monies don't seem to be a lot. It's one of those things, you want money? you better raise it yourself. Uh, so, yeah. so far, that's what I'm seeing for the most common disasters. Um, well, I'll keep looking. Yeah, and it's, there's, so Myron, there's, there's more opportunities for grants um, when, it, when a disaster happens. So if there's a specific incident that you can tie to Yep. Um, a lot of times there's, there's, you know, you can find money to get programmatic help. So help with people. Um, so if I wanted to hire a disaster recovery coordinator and a couple of disaster case managers, more than likely I could find money to do that. Where you ha where it's hard to find money for um, after a disaster has happened is the money to help with the unmet needs that are left, you know, that, that, are brought up through that long-term recovery process through all of that. And so, um, you know, a lot of times we lean heavily into Lutheran disaster response and the money that's available church-wide um, for that and writing a, writing a grant and, and trying to connect with, with that. Um, you know, currently with our, you know, as I told you all at the beginning of this, we're a member of that Midwest Consortium for Disaster Services that through through 2022, that, that Midwest Consortium for Disaster Services has access to 
a lot of unmet needs funding that um, that is provided through the grant that that we were working out of with that. And so we have, um, you know, through the end of that grant, we have access to a, a significant amount of funding um, that can, you know, easily get fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars into the hand of the Senate to to help with, you know, whatever needs have have arised that we need to to get that level of money into. Um, you know, one of one example that of of money that we've received as a Senate to help with with things was when COVID was happening early on and we had the opportunity to to get some funding through Lucan Disaster Response for feeding projects. And so to to make an impact on our, our different ministries or ministries that we're affiliated with, whether that's local congregations or other entities that we work with to help with the feeding and help with the financial aid of the financial component of that. Um, and so in my time of working with the Senate, that's the only grant that I've that I've written and received money for. Um, I think that there'll probably be, whether it's through uh, through the flooding from the Toma from a few weeks ago or this current flooding right now, probably be a chance to ask for some money to help um, help out in those situations. So there's there's more um, more to be seen, kind of in a waiting game. Um, as like I said, when we were talking through the phases of disaster, we work a lot through that recovery phase, and so. Um, it takes a little bit to get to there. So, I was surprised so much the diagram you shared of the uh, longevity, uh, the events, the heroism looks like other models in social services, essentially. Uh, mm -hmm. it's not, um, uh, uh, issues with child abuse or rape or uh, other issues like that, except they don't usually have the, the his, the heroic peak in there. Uh, but, um... right. Yeah, much of this work w within the disaster world is is kind of running parallel with social service work. Um, whether that's the way that the case management happens, like it, it's, it's disaster specific and it's looking at a specific event. Um, and so that that informs the way that the work is being done, but it, it it parallels a lot with with what's learned in social services and what's happened um, in the in those different places um, and working with vulnerable populations and working with um, you know people in that have been impacted by trauma and and you know and so that's like the it's a, a look at how trauma impacts you pretty much mm -hmm. um, so. Any other thoughts on uh, on what what I've been rambling about or um, questions? And if not, we'll, we'll we'll go into another quick section here before we end the meeting. Okay. So as as I've been trying to, you know, in some ways. Um, you know, establish conference disaster teams. It's one of my goals was to have a, a conference disaster team in each of the five conferences within the Central State Center. Um, and I think that I jumped the gun on that a little bit um, in, in trying to get information into people's hands and kind of letting the word of mouth kind of build up some more interest. Um, you know, having you know, five or six people on the call today has been has been really encouraging, um, you know, to have in several of you are, you know, coming back for a, for a second or third conversation with me, and so this is great. And so what I'm what I'm thinking of is establishing, for the time being, um, as as we as we gather some more thoughts and and start planning and start building some momentum, just an overall synod-wide disaster team. And so what I'm hoping to do is have a group of folks that are interested in um, in talking through uh, what, what this looks like and talking through how to begin to, how to better get the information into the hands of the folks that 
want to participate um because i know that those people exist um and it's just it's it's difficult um to to always be to be able to get that uh that information into their hands um and so part of being able to do that is having more people knowing how to get into congregations in different places or you know spread the information in a different way through your conference as opposed to just through the conference dean um who a lot of times the conference deans are are, are pretty spread thin um in, in their capacity and follow up and those kind of things um and so what i what i'd like to propose is you know a, a conversation going forward um as we look at you know what we want to be focusing on um you know I know that when Donovan first came uh, to to the conference meeting for the Eastern Missouri Conference, he kind of happened upon up, upon our meeting um, details uh, because he was looking for, you know, getting his congregation involved in in doing the the stuff with Habitat for Humanity, and then saw this and saw well maybe this is a way for our our church to get involved in you know, building projects and those kind of things through the, the center of disaster work. And so that's, that's a different place than, you know, when Myron came, you know, Myron's wanting to get involved and in bringing his, 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 you know, broad range of experience with social service stuff and um, in the state of Kansas and, you know, bringing in that experience to help think through structures and think through trainings and think through communication and, you know, there's there's a wide range of what's bringing each of us to this conversation, and I want to give us a place to to expand more into that, a place that we can talk through and um, kind of brainstorm and dream a little bit about what what it could look like within the Central State Senate and what's realistic to what it could be. Um, and so, I just want to hear some of your guys, y'all's your, thoughts on that. And if that sounds like something that you would be interested in participating in as we begin to develop uh, a, a, a groundwork of, of a disaster program. And it's, most of that work would be on me. It's not going to be on, on y'all. And it's just going to be, I need people to talk with me and, and bounce ideas off and um, help me think and help keep my, my focus and those kind of things. But um because I, I I can't do it all on my own, um, but just curious your thoughts. Well, we talked about the whole idea of awareness to begin with, uh, to make people aware of what's happening. Because I don't think generally I've attended any congregations in the last fifty-five years that are aware uh, that they actually could have a part in some kind of a disaster response. Um, we talked about publications, articles uh, to keep information in front of congregations, and we also uh, one of my one of my thoughts was there are a lot of people that don't have chainsaws or or the physical abilities to get out there and and remove mud and and rebuild the stairways and and the things that it might take for some of that. But there are awful lot of them that have business, secretarial, uh, fundraising, and other kinds of skills uh, that we would probably want on uh, as part of any movement ahead of time. So I, I think one of the first things is saying what the scope, what scope are you looking at during this phase of uh, the process? Uh, is you also you all have uh, a lot of background information about working with uh, co-ads and VOADs and all those things that we don't have. Uh, at least I don't think we do. But uh, I really, when you talk about disaster relief, that's a huge. Even for our, our simple states area, that would be a huge, huge uh, undertaking. So you need to kind of figure out what portion of that you want to go for first because implementing implementing a huge 
broad sweeping program would be kind of difficult. And so I think if you say, okay, here's our plan. This is what we're gonna do in awareness. This is what we're gonna do in making sure people know about volunteer opportunities and the types of opportunities, seeing what kind of skills we have out there that we could figure out a way to use in disaster situations or scenarios. I mean, the, yeah. the, the plan is what you really need. And then we plug things into it like articles and, and those kinds of things. Yeah, and so, so, so y'all know, Myron and I have had a few conversations. One of the things that we've been talking about is having a um, kind of an assessment tool to try to get into the hands of congregations to assess, you know, where they are in interest. You know, do they have people that are interested in this work? Do they have, you know, teams um, that have experience of going to different disaster sites and and doing this work that they've been doing it for a long time? Like Mike that popped in, he sent me a message saying that they have lots of experience with excuse me, going and helping with rebuilding in Katrina and the flooding in Nashville and Iowa and Hurricane Harvey. And you know, we have, you know, multiple different congregations that have been doing that, just not within, you know, not within the structure of the Synod. And so, um, you know, trying to get a grip, a grip on, assess what's happening within the, the congregations to see who we have available and what those resources are and what that experience is so that we can then go into a little bit more of developing a plan of what that might look like for the rest of us. Um, if you could develop interest so, enough that congregations would take a look at what their own fears are relative to disasters. I mean, it's different based on your community I'm sure if I lived in Manhattan, I would have a lot of sleepless nights with uh, the dam there. Uh, if I were living in Garden City, Kansas, where the, where the altitude of uh, the level of land is dropping at about 18 inches a year because it's gonna cave in someday because the aquifer is dry up. Um, if I were living near a chemical plant of some sort or or I had a, my church building in a low lying flood area or things that they're gonna have different sets of fears uh, and concerns about what can we be doing to have our own disaster plan. And that's also a place at the same time where you begin talking with them about uh, Central State Senate disaster plans. Uh, yep. And that's, that's that survey is also where you find out how many callers you have, how many people get on 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 uh, the telephones or online and and uh, round up food for a food for feeding people or whatever else goes on. So, yeah. Well, there are lots of ways you can approach it. Um. So any other any other thoughts from anyone outside of Myron here? Um, I know that we're we're running up on the, the end of our time together tonight. I just think you know the question of what's your what's your role outcome that you're looking to do and and what would that look like? What would you like to have in place if your mm -hmm. outcome is to have a synod wide you know, what would be the things you'd be noticing? What is it that you would like to see as a part of that? And then back uh, into that might be one one strategy yeah. to get there. So I kind of like the idea of, you know, helping churches think about what would, what would we need to be more concerned about? And as you were talking about insurance, I was going through my head, I wonder what we have here at this church. I wonder if we're covered by you know, this or that, and just, you know, knowledge and that's resident in the congregations. So kind yeah. of from pre-planning would be helpful perhaps too for councils. Okay. And, and your that's plan doesn't that. have to look the same right. the day you start as it does five years down the road. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't know that I would try to hit every possible thing at one time. I, I think I would try to get people to coalesce around some things that they can accomplish. Uh, and, and then with a general awareness as other things are happening. And I, I think that as you have more volunteers also, more people interested with skills, then you can, you'll be able to proceed into, into more services, more, more and better responses. Yeah. I don't know, just one idea, but uh, I, I'm not, I'm kind of not seeing the plan right now. And so I, I think you need a plan of some sort that says, sure. here's what we're going to concentrate on. Here's our timelines. Here's our objectives. Uh, and how can we get any of these things accomplished? What methods can we use? And then we go there. I mean, we can write articles and we can send uh, things to you for inclusion in, in uh, newsletters and and all those things, and we can attend district conferences, and we can attend national or the uh, Senate Assembly and things like that. Uh, but we need to know what it is we're wanting to, to push. Yeah, and I've intentionally left that open a little bit um, in trying to see who who's coming to the table and what their interests are but Myron, i think you're right that i need to have a little bit more than what i've given um i, so I, I you know i uh, sorry ben uh, i'm joyce benedict and i'm in uh, shawnee kansas and i am coming at this from an individual standpoint not from not representing a congregation and my interest is maybe being part of a chainsaw crew, you know, some of the, and, and I talked to a couple of other people that would be willing to help in that initial response phase. And so I'm, that that's kind of my interest. I'm a hands-on person. And anyway, I just, I listened to Ben at the Central States Assembly and I thought, well, I'll log on to just, you know, kind of hear what his plan is and can I help and be part of LDR? So it's a little different perspective, Myron, uh, but that's, that's where I'm at. Well, there will be men, I think well, be people who really are looking for that experience. Yeah. I I, th I think forming an assessment for each congregation is wonderful, but I think you need to give them a little bit of guidance here. Are you looking at three or four different areas? I was involved with the Red Cross for a long time, so perhaps you could say how many people are interested in being a direct response team? How many are interested in learning how to form a shelter and feeding? How many are interested in running the chainsaws? How many, give them four or five yeah. different areas. So they've got an idea sure. of what they're looking Yeah, and, and I'm, not, I'm not ready to send that assessment out. Uh, and what I'm thinking of, you know, I'm thinking of having an, another meeting here in another month maybe and seeing if y'all would be willing to, to come back and, and talk with me some more, have some, have some time to kind of mull it over.